Welcome back in. Someone who knows the former president well and served in his administration, former Attorney General Bill Barr, is here with me. Mr. Attorney General, welcome to In the Courts. Thank you, Katie. Good Thanks for joining here. us. Yeah, my pleasure. So starting off the top, some people argue that this indictment, this criminal case, is the most important in American history because of the allegations getting at the foundation of American democracy, the voting system, but also because this is the only criminal case against the former president that has to do with his conduct in office and trying to keep that office. So do you think, is it the most important criminal case in American history? Well, for the, the second reason, that it's the it's, uh, first time a president has been indicted uh, for something like this, and uh, it will have consequences for who's the next president, potentially. Yes, it's, it's among the most important thing. But as a matter of law, as to the legal issues being addressed, I'm not sure that, you know, that they're that monumental. Why? Well, because I think the, the, um, the conduct here was, was clearly very bad conduct. And the question is, is it a stretch? Is it, you know, an abuse to treat it as defrauding the government and also obstructing a proceeding? And I don't think it is. I think this is the way the government would normally be expected to respond to this kind of behavior that is subverting a fundamental proceeding. Uh, now, you could say, as a prudential matter, should the case have been brought? And there's some reasons not to have brought, uh, brought the case, but it, you know this attack, uh, saying you know this is this is uh, an abuse, it's it's weaponization, it's you know this is not a crime against humanity. It may have been a a, a poor judgment to bring the case, but the case is a legitimate legal case. You may mention that there are reasons maybe not to bring the case. What would that be? Well, I you know I do think you have. To, well, I, I think. The reasons don't have to do with fairness to Trump. One reason to bring, not bring this case is not because it's unfair to Trump. Okay. Okay. It has to do with its impact on the public and the public interest. Do you think it's a political act not to bring the case? Yes, it would be largely based on, on politics, but in a good sense, which is the, the public interest. Do we want to have this kind of divisiveness, especially given their inept handling of the Biden matter, which to me was inexplicable. I mean, it's just what, what they've done with, with the Biden case. And I'm talking about the, the Hunter Biden case and the issue of whether Joe Biden was involved in some of that. And it just uh, exacerbates the whole perception, which I think is a legitimate perception, that there's a double standard at the Department of Justice. And bringing an aggressive case like this, while not an abuse, uh, at a time where you're not being very aggressive uh, against the president's son, I, I think uh, has a bad impact on the public and on the perceptions about the Justice Department. That's a legitimate consideration. You I also think, that. by the way, that this case helps Trump. And in that respect, um, you know, it does affect the election uh, by, uh, it turns out, by going after Trump, you're, you're, you're really helping Trump a great deal. I, I wonder if that's a wise thing to do. Um, so there, there are legi uh, and I think arguments that this could have a chilling effect on legitimate activity, political activity in the future, will it make inhibit people from challenging ele election results? I, I think it's a bit overblown, but I think it's a legitimate consideration. So these are, that doesn't mean it's an invalid case, but it goes to whether it's prudent to bring it. And uh, I'm not sure I would have approved it, but uh, I think the attacks against uh, the department on this are, are you know, sort of over the top. At this you, point. Just because you mentioned the Hunter Biden case, do you think what he's been offered is a sweetheart deal, as people are saying? I definitely do uh, believe it was. And uh, I also think the department was holding all the cards, went into those discussions and came, to, came out with all its pockets picked, and I don't understand why that happened. But the other thing is that it has to be clarified, and I think the AG has to provide assurance that there has been a vigorous investigation of all the red flags that have come up about whether Joe Biden was participating, uh, you know, in these profits that his son, and, and was helping his son's business essentially sell access. And uh, he was the access that was being sold. And uh, that has to be investigated, and I'm worried, given the ambiguity of what the, uh, the prosecutor is saying, Weiss. Uh, I, 
what has he been doing for two and a half years? This has to be clarified. I want to ask you about a senior unnamed co-conspirator, a senior DOJ official in the indictment. We have now been able to deduce that that was Jeffrey Clark. He mm -hmm. worked under you in two different positions, both with ENRD, Environmental and Natural Resources Division, and as acting head of the Civil Division. You were colleagues. You worked together. What's your opinion of him? Uh, he was sort of a Casper Milktoast kind of guy, and I was sort of surprised that he ended up, you know, trying to overthrow the leadership of the Department of Justice so he could carry out a part in this whole uh, episode. Uh, he, he was a uh, experienced litigator in the environmental field and he uh, handled the, as you said, the environmental group. And then toward the, toward the end of the administration, with not much time left, the head of the civil division that handles civil litigation left. And because he was an experienced litigator, had, who had already been confirmed and was at a senior level, we moved him over laterally to that new to that vacancy. Were you surprised to see him listed as an unnamed co-conspirator? Did any of these allegations surprise you? O of what he did? Yes. No, I mean we I'd read stories about you know this and obviously the people involved in it at the department who uh, he was trying to overthrow, namely the, uh, Jeff Rosen and, and Richard Donahue are people I know and you know I heard some about heard some stuff about this. Knowing what you know now about what President Trump did while he was still in office, you were investigating some of the claims that he was making and doing the due diligence there, assuring him that they were not true. And knowing that some of the allegations that are contained in here, do you think that he belongs in prison? Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think uh, he belongs in the White House or in the Oval Office, uh, but I don't like the idea of us putting former presidents in prison. And so uh, I, would, I, I hope this doesn't end up with him in prison, even if he's convicted. The idea is because he's a political opponent of the current president. But this No, but also, I mean, uh, I think it makes us look a little bit like a banana republic. I don't like the idea of, of using the uh, criminal justice process much in politics. I think we use it too much. I don't, I'm, I'm not saying this is not a, a legitimate case, but uh, I just don't like the idea of... Uh, taking uh, people who have governed the United States as our foremost magistrate and putting them in prison unless it's really a serious uh, a serious uh, abuse that uh, most of the country would agree with. And I think here, as long as a lot of the country thinks that this is not, uh, you know, that this is a political effort, I think that would be a mistake. Former President Trump essentially ran on one of the campaign slogans, lock her up, about his political opponent. Did you share those concerns or express those then or about that? Uh, which concerns? That he ran on the campaign slogan, lock her up, which would be essentially the same thing of locking up a political opponent or using the Department of Justice. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, he, at, at some point he became very mad at me. He didn't directly confront me, but, you know, he was upset that more action wasn't taken against Hillary Clinton. But the ironic thing is, in my, one of my first conversations with him, he said, actually, he said, I don't think she should be locked up. And I, you know, and, and I, I think that we didn't tell the public that one. No, and nor did I at the time. But he, it, it, because, because it would make us look like a banana republic and we have to move beyond that. I just want to ask you, because we have your expertise here, having been the attorney general twice, and this is a conversation topic that came up during the Mueller investigation. Is it possible, if he is elected in 2024, for him to pardon himself? Is a self-pardon by a president legitimate, do you think? Uh, you know, that's nothing I, I feel I can opine on because I haven't studied it. Uh, but it did its, come up a lot during the Mueller investigation. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it never got to the point where I felt I had to crack the books and really study the matter. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. I think that the Constitution doesn't limit it that way. There's nothing in the Constitution to say he couldn't pardon himself. So I'd, I'd want to look and see if there's a, what what are the basis for an argument that inherently it's you know could not have been conceived that he could pardon himself. All right, Mr. Attorney General, thank yeah. you for okay. joining us Thanks, in the courts. Thanks, Katie. Thank you.